The website you see plugged here, I'm just going to start with a quick plug to it. That's a brand new website, started in December, and it's nothing more than a collection of uh, political news, political opinions uh, from around the state, state politics. Uh, it's a good place to go find information. I've, after I put it together, I found myself using the links on it to go look at Alison and a bunch of other things. You know, why bookmark it? I can just go out to this one and, and use it. Well, you may not know it, but there's this horrible creature that haunts the Alabama countryside. It's got long fangs, it's got sharp claws, and it's got a ravenous hunger. Left unchecked, it will destroy our prisons, and it will allow violent criminals to wander our streets freely. It will deny medical treatment to thousands of Medicaid recipients. It will oppress our children in the tyranny of illiteracy, and it will allow corrupt officials to cheat and steal without limits. This evil creature is the budget shortfall beast. Now, I know the rhetoric is a little much, and it's a little tongue-in-cheek even, but that's the kind of thing you can expect to hear. And uh, a lot of people believe it, that kind of uh, predictions, because we hear it all the time. Every year we hear that we're going to have a budget shortfall, or proration, or massive spending cuts. Every single year, there's not a single budget year that goes by without it, without these claims. Most agencies go along with that. As they make their requests for money, they also tell you all the bad things that are going to happen. For example, I'll give you one example in the current budget year. The Ethics Commission says that without a 20% increase in funding, they will not be able to maintain their current workload. Let me rephrase that a little bit. If you only increase our funding by 19%, we're going to do less work than we did yesterday. Okay? These are the kind of things that you hear. It's very common. So what we need to do is we need to uh, look at these things a lot critically. Do you all remember the $1.2 billion tax increase? Do you all remember the claims about it? Okay. School systems would go bankrupt and they'd close. We'd lose sports programs. Uh, violent prisoners would wander the streets because we couldn't have any place to keep them. Uh, seniors would be evicted from nursing homes. We'd have fewer state troopers on the streets. All of these were claims that were made about what would happen if we didn't pass the tax. Well, we didn't pass the tax, and none of them happened. These are the kind of claims that we have to really look at. When they start telling you the doom and gloom, we've got to look at it real close. Let's start by looking at the claims behind the shortfall. What are the claims being made? Well, first off, we have a $250 million shortfall in our budget. This, of course, ignores the $500 million extra in the Education Trust Fund that they admit we have, we have $250 million less in the general fund than they claim than they need to meet today's expenses. That's the claim. Further, the shortfall is caused by unfunded mandates on the uh, Medicaid agency. This is the blame. It's not our fault. We didn't do it. The evil federal government did it. They're making us spend this extra money. Okay? It's not our fault. And then their solution. Well, we either have to cut spending, and then there's the horrible consequences about people without Medicaid will lose matching federal funds and everything else, or we have to raise taxes, which is, of course, every legislator's favorite uh, topic. And the one thing, again, I want to reiterate is that the legislature has claimed shortfalls for at least the past five years. Now, I only go back five years because that's as far as my memory goes. I don't remember what happened in the mid-90s. I'm, I'm pretty sure they did then, too, but since I can't prove it, I'm not going to claim it. <laughs> but that's what, the, uh, that's what the thing looks like. I always think it's a good idea when people talk about a shortfall. There's two sides to a budget. Budget is an equation. There's two sides to that equation. There's the spending and there's the income. Now, they're all saying that the shortfall is a shortfall in income. The, the equation is unbalanced because of too little money. But it's also possibly unbalanced if there's too much spending. And so we have to look and see if that's the kind of thing that's happening. This chart was pulled from the budget documents available online at the Executive Budget Office. And it shows the Alabama spending since the year 2000. And you can see that we've had steady increases in spending. As a matter of fact, the state budget has increased by an average of 6.2% a year or $982 million since 1999. Now, you remember last year, the last budget, the governor said we've cut everything to the bone. 
And you've heard legislators say it this year. We're cut to the bone. We can't cut any more. Does that look like bone or fat? That's a lot of money. And you can see some years are better than others. 2004 was probably the uh, the smallest at $710 million, only $710 million. But 2003 was $1,400 million, $1.4 billion increase in spending. That's a lot of money. If you go back to 1999, you'll see that we've increased by almost $6 billion a year, 43% increase in spending since 1999. It's what, five, six years ago? That's a lot of money. That is a lot of money. Judging from this, we can't tell if there is excessive spending, but we can sure tell that there has been spending. And it does tend to hint that spending might be part of the problem. This is a total number. This is a total number. Uh, I could have broken it down by... Um, by Education Trust Fund and General Fund, and in fact, I do have those figures broken down that way on um, politicsalabama.org, and you'll find that they do, both of the uh, uh, funds increase steadily over the years. It toggles some, t- some years one way, some years the other. Um, two years ago, the general fund grew a lot faster than the Education Trust Fund did. This year, there's no comparison. The Education Trust Fund is ten times you know, growing ten times as fast as the uh, uh, the general fund. Um, and I want to thank the governor, by the way, for coming out with his uh, uh, his budget last night, so I had time to incorporate it. <laughs> um, the agencies have requested their money. Medicaid agency wants 127 million dollars more. The Department of Public Health wants 48 million dollars more. Department of Human Resources wants 47 million dollars more. The Department of Corrections is my favorite because they want to double their budget. That is literally double their budget. It's a 100% increase in funding. And it doesn't take much. It, you know, the, the, the projection is we're going to have between 5 and 7% more revenue in the next budget year than as we had this year. It doesn't take much intelligence to say, with a, let's split the difference, with a 6% projected increase in funding, we can't afford 100% increases in spending. But you'll see agencies all throughout the budget requesting 20, 40, 50 percent. It just so happens the Department of Corrections is the worst offender at 100 percent. But they're not the only ones. More evidence to show that, yeah, it could be overspending that's causing this budget problem that we're having. Well, the governor's come out with his uh, proposed budget. And you'll see $10.2 billion for the general fund, $10.3 billion dollars for the education trust fund, we broke 20 billion, ladies and gentlemen. That's a target we've been shooting at for years, but we broke 20 billion. Only a 174 million dollar increase for general fund. Wait a minute, I thought we had 250 million dollars too little. But without a tax increase, he managed to find 174 million dollars more. Hmm. Remember, we're going to answer the question at the end. Is the budget shortfall factor myth? I I could stop now, but I won't. (laughs) The Education Trust Fund got almost a billion dollars more in his suggested budget. Now, this isn't what the legislature is going to pass. This is what he is presenting for them to build off of. Our total spending is more than $20 billion. That's a $1.1 billion increase, almost one point two. And as I uh, was telling uh, Don Markwell, who was on WACV 1170 as a talk show host, I think the governor was thinking of him because he proposed an $1170 million increase in spending. So. <laughs> 6% increase in spending, which is pretty much what the uh, uh, projections were for increase in funding. They projected about five, between 5 and 7% increase in funding. Pretty good. That's a lot of information, so let's uh, look at this a little bit. A budget shortfall, as I said earlier, can be caused. Like this is going to be a short presentation. I don't. <laughs> the, the topic is is not that complicated when you look at it. You know, the, the the newspapers and the politicians like to make it complicated, but it's just not that complicated. 
A budget shortfall can be caused by one of two things. Too little money, too much spending. Um, there have been claims that we had too little money. Well, the governor managed a $174 million spending increase in the general fund with no tax increases. The money was there. That's what that says. The money was there. The claims were false. They had to be. Both the general fund and the education trust fund show a spending increase. And you can see the general fund is increasing by 1.7%, the education by 106 Dramatic growth in the education trust fund, little growth in the general fund, but they're both increasing. I think we can answer the question now. Budget shortfall, fact or myth? It's a myth. Yes, absolutely. There's, there's no question about it. It's not caused by inadequate rev revenue, and to be honest, it's not caused by excessive spending. It just isn't there. Okay? There is no budget shortfall. It'd be real easy to, just to, to, to live within it. You can't say there's a budget shortfall when you're spending an extra $1.1 billion this year. There's no budget shortfall. <clears throat> um, in my honest opinion, when you hear about budget shortfalls, when you hear about prorations, when you hear about <clears throat> all the horrible things, these are just tactics, political tactics, for no other reason than to create a panic, to create a crisis that the that the uh, public can get behind and say, you're right, it's something that needs to be fixed, to justify their need for the extra money. And that's about all it is. Did a little bit of math. And if the budget continues to increase at the current rate, 6.2%, we'll break the $30 billion mark in five years. Five years. It took us a decade to get from 10 to 20. It's going to take us five years to get from 20 to 30. Told you it was a short one. <laughs> uh, the budget shortfall doesn't exist. You can see from the charts that the problem may not be excessive spending this year. Probably was excessive spending on a long-term basis. Well, since you brought out the credit keyword for racism, mm -hmm. the, the folk in Alabama you just say it, you know, like bringing the cross in front of the vampire. I... I think it's actually a badge of honor for Alabama, right? And you've got a state constitution that tries to keep this ridiculous legislature and this duopoly that runs our government in check. So when they make these ridiculous assertions in the budget and it's not there, there's already check in place. I mean, that's pretty valid. Uh, it's, it's the real world. It's how every Alabama family lives you know, with proration. You come up and you find, oops, we use a little too much electricity this month. It's an extra 50 bucks. We'll just uh, cut off two nights out at the uh, restaurants this month. You spent more money in one area, guess what? That's proration. So you cut it elsewhere. That's the way Alabama families live every day. That's the way the state government should live, and it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Now, risk of putting words in your mouth, I think what you're saying is see, the budget is just a shell game. It's just this, this fantasy land. Let's go out there and, you know, throw this wonderful thing out, this sort of a wish list. Well, Anybody can come up with a wish list. What really matters is reality. So, I mean, what's really the big deal over budgets? I mean, it's like when my church does a budget. And they want, you know, all these wonderful things. We never do them. Right. And everybody knows we're not going to do them when you start it out, right? Absolutely. And you'll see that a lot. When the budget hits the desk, the news media treats that as what the state government needs, must have to function in the coming year. Well, it's not that. It's a request for spending increase. The Department of Corrections asked for $266 million. Where is it? There it is. They got three. They'll live. They won't be able to do, build the two prisons they wanted. They won't be able to do a lot of things they wanted to do. But they'll survive. They'll continue. They got an additional $3 million in the governor's proposed budget. I don't think that'll survive the legislature, by the way. Budget shortfall. <laughs> well, again... I still say there is no budget shortfall. If there was an actual budget shortfall, you would spend $250 million less in the general fund than we did last year, and we're not. We're spending $174 million more. So there is no budget shortfall. It's a myth. It's a complete manufactured thing to put pressure on us to approve tax increases. That's it. What about the uh, Medicaid uh, claim about unspent funded mandates in the federal government? 
there were some of those. I, I, I uh, saw the breakdown last night. There were some of those. But there was another 140 some odd million dollars which was, had nothing to do with federal mandates, had to do with uh, opening a new building they wanted to open and some other things. Had nothing to do with federal mandates. Some of it did, yes. But again, they got something that sounds good. They got a nice-looking peg they can hang the hat on. Unfunded mandates. Yes, they did have some of that. There's the peg. We got $100 million in unfunded mandates. We can uh, hang up there a $266 million request for spending for uh, funding increase. Nice peg, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's hard to argue with... Medicaid and unfunded mandates. You know, if they're talking about the Sports Hall of Fame, we're going to double the budget for the Sports Hall. That's an easy target, you know. You're going to double the budget for what? But for Medicaid, it's hard to argue against the Medicaid increase. You know, people look at you like you're some kind of a monster. that eat babies, you know. You're that. <laughs> yes, sir. I haven't went through very long with the city, but I was going to say, the agency you listed on this page are most of the heads of those agencies appointed by the governor? Excellent question, and not yeah, one I have the answer to. become political, where who's ever ahead of an agency is trying to get the governor's, um, I don't know, maybe he has more pull with his boss, or I, I don't know how these people are appointed. But they say it's become political. And Well, I'm sure there's some of that in there. Uh, I don't have the answer to that question. There's a lot of state agencies, and I just haven't gone to look to see which are appointed and which are merit rate and all that kind of stuff. So I don't know the answer. The, uh, yeah, the agencies, the heads of the agencies are appointed by the government. So all of the agencies, including Medicaid, um, is appointed by the governor, except the Department of Public Health. The director of public health is appointed by I think that's the Alabama Medical Association. And um, but not some of the appointments come from the agencies themselves. Now I don't believe the head of the Department of Corrections is there's something interesting about that person working for that department or uh, is it that, I don't know if anybody I mean this seems so out of touch with or out of with the other agencies, this increase would be not only well, now keep in mind, they requested $266 million. They only got $3 million. So that's not a huge increase in their budget. Um, and I don't know what the politics are behind it, unfortunately. Well, they're always making claims about, and they're probably correct, that the prisons are over full and that they need more prisons. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they are, from what I know, they're pretty cool. But we've got a private prison being built here in the state, and the state government has said we will not use it. I think there's even a state law that says they can't, which can be changed this legislative session. Is this a, I don't know, if you look at other budgets, is the Department of Corrections always number one if they're asking for more money than anybody else is doing anywhere else? Um, actually, Medicaid is the biggie. It takes, what was the figure, uh, I think 34 or 35% of the general fund budget. And I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of... Uh, Oh, oh, I thought you were disagreeing with me. <laughs> um, and I think it takes somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 18 or 19 percent of the total state spending. That's a huge chunk just for one department, you know. But that's where I think that is the biggest agency. Uh, after that would probably have to be the schools, I'm, I'm guessing, the K through 12. So corrections request for increases kind of out of proportion to their. A hundred percent increase in funding is always out of proportion. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't care what, you, what agency you are. You know, doubling your, your budget in one year, that's always ridiculous. So. Um, with Medicaid, they're actually pretty good at the budgetary shuffle themselves. I found this uh, when I was working for the governor to be particularly amazing. What we do in the state of Alabama, you know, for Medicaid, the state has to match the spending by the federal government. And 90% of it comes from the federal government, so, or something to that effect. And Alabama has to match the 10%. And so to support nursing homes, who are big lobbying groups in Montgomery, as a matter of fact, some of our legislators are invested in nursing homes. Um, the, uh, you have to come up with matching money, and it's very, very expensive. It's, on the order of forty thousand dollars a year just for the housing of one person. So what they do is they tax nursing home beds 
1500 or 2500 a bed? Yeah. That one is a tax charged to the federal government. And they turn around and call that their match. Isn't it lovely? Yes, sir. I'm just curious. I mean, I'm, you know, different states tax different things. So, you know, I can look at Florida, so there's all sorts of weird and a lot of taxes. I think somebody in Florida has thought about taxing. And then I'm not done. I haven't said anything about it. It's just like a very odd fiscal system. How did they arrive at having a big impact on the United that was long before I got here, but we, they'll tax just about anything they can get their hands on. There's a, there's a 10 cent tax on a deck of playing cards. I'm not kidding. Okay. There, there, there used to be something to fight gambling with. Obviously, a deck of playing cards isn't the big gambling demon anymore, so they don't use it for that, but it goes right into the general fund and have fun with it. But they'll tax anything they can get. There's a bill in front of the legislature right now that will um, allow, or will actually not allow us to deduct our federal income tax from our state income tax. So that money we pay to the feds, we have to have that taxed and pay state taxes on it. Isn't that wonderful? You know, and, and these are the kind of things they do. You know, and they're talking now about what a, a five five percent tax on um, uh, our nickel tax on soft drinks, or actually any bottled drink. So you know, they'll, they'll tax anything they get their hands on. It has nothing to do with fiscal responsibility or what they need. It has to do with what they can get away with. You know. And that's exactly what we're looking at here. That's what this whole thing with this budget shortfall is. You know, the governor says we're not going to do taxes. You know, well, Hubbard, Paul Hubbard, is complaining about almost every single thing the governor has proposed. And if uh, Paul Hubbard gets his way, which he's got a lot of clout, uh, then you know, there's very little that the legislature is going to be able to do except raise taxes. The, um, you know, again, not because they need to spend the money, but because they want to spend the money. I don't think anybody that I've ever met can look at this kind of a spending increase in one year and say it's it's justified. You know, that's a, almost a 1.2 billion dollar spending increase. And if you look at the year that the governor pre- presented his 1.2 billion dollar tax increase proposal, said we got to spend this extra 1.2 billion dollars, how much did our spending go up? Yeah. A, a pretty good amount, right? So he wasn't talking about overall a $1.2 billion increase in spending. He was talking about that on top of what we normally would see, which would have put us at a $2 billion increase at least in one year. It's ridiculous. Okay? These are overreaching legislators. These are people who see about spending money and want to spend it. That's how they get their power. Yes, sir? Uh, can you explain why the general fund is so much, there's so much less growth in revenue in the general fund than there is in education it has to do with the types of taxes going to each of the funds. Um, what they do is they, is they education trust fund is, is uh, funded with, like, for example, uh, sales tax, which is something they've been complaining about for a long time because in a, in a bad time, educa- you know, economic times, sales decline, sales tax collections decline, and guess what? The kids don't have all the money they need to, to eat their hot meal and to work on their computer and surf out to all those websites. Uh, the general fund doesn't get that kind of, uh, they don't have growth taxes to, to go to feed them. So an economic boon doesn't really help the state, as we're seeing. You see that the, the, incre- the sales tax collections has increased the education trust fund by almost a billion dollars this year. Okay? But because they don't have growth taxes behind the general fund. And of course you realize that the whole education trust fund was created specifically to get around a constitutional limitation on spending, right? You can't make exp- or, um, uh, uh, spend. Oh, let's see, how does this go? It's been a while since I've looked at it. There's a limitation on the spending increases you can make to education out of the general fund until uh, before your um, uh, debt is paid off. As long as you have debt, you can't increase more to education out of the general fund. Simple answer: create a different fund, funnel all your education uh, spending through that. Now you can have all the debt you want and still increase your spending at the education level. So the whole creation of the Education Trust Fund, well, okay, one way of looking at it, (laughs) is that it was created as a dodge to get around spending limitations.
how do we pay off that one little set they came up with this rainy day fund thing to do and mm -hmm. maybe even store a little bit of money away and dare we use it to have a little bit of revenue smoothly. But once again, that's not the Right, and again, since the Education Trust Fund was con constructed uh, via the Constitution, you actually need a Constitution amendment in order to change the money going into it. So we had $500 million extra going into the Education Trust Fund. Because of the way the legislature set it up, they couldn't just transfer the money because that money is earmarked. The sales tax money is earmarked going into education. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I had the information last night, but I don't remember it. <laughs> the governor pr printed up a, uh, well, okay, the legislative fiscal office posted a, an entire document showing all the sources of revenue, how much they're going to get, where it's going to go, and it was 137 pages long, so I don't didn't memorize it. <laughs> Sorry. Teachers from Alabama are now paid, I think it's above the regional average, or maybe it's even above the national average. I looked at that two years ago and found out that teachers were paid in the neighborhood of $35,000 as an average salary, and that the average Alabamian salary was in the neighborhood of $29,000. So teachers are getting paid more than everybody else on average. You know. For nine months. Yeah, for nine months of work. Well, I'd love to have a three-month vacation and, you know, not have to worry about... <laughs> So, so you know that's that's the kind of thing you're looking at. That's a, I mean, if that is the case, I mean, that's, that's, I mean it, it would seem that it would be very easy to uh, cover all their bases and then some, with just giving the teachers the normal cost of living. Well, you have to deal with the legislators. Each legislator has their own pet program that they want to see increased, and. Uh, there it is. And you have to deal with it because you can't just, the governor can pre present anything he wants, but the legislators are the ones that vote on it. As a matter of fact, as we all know, it often comes down to one legislator, the chairman of the committee that the bill goes to. And if the chairman of the committee doesn't like the bill, it never gets on the agenda. And we've seen that, haven't we, John? Haven't we, Dick? Haven't we seen this with ballot access legislation? It goes to the Constitution and Elections Committee. Gwen doesn't like it. It never comes up. One legislator, the way we've got our system structured, can block anything they want, as long as they're on the right committee. And so when you get the spending increases for this or, or spending cuts or whatever for this agency or that agency, it can be blocked. Real simple. Or they can turn around and uh, put in a special bill for a special appropriation and uh, put it that way. There's already one bill in the legislature for another tax exemption. It's not even a charity. It's a uh, thrift store. Well, I understand that thrift stores do a good, good job, but... A sales tax exemption? They're talking about we have a $250 million shortfall and they want to give a, a tax exemption? What is this? You know, It doesn't make any sense, but that's because the source there's not one source for these bills. There's 140 sources in the legislation, and that's why. We're talking about giving the exemption to thrift stores? One specific thrift store. Not even all thrift stores, just one thrift store. And, and that's, that's part of the craziness of our system, you know. Yeah. I'm all for giving tax exemptions, but I'm all for thrift stores. Well, well, it's like Montgomery earlier, or, or I was going to say earlier this year, but last year came up with a brilliant idea to have a sales tax holiday where the state or the city and the county would get together and they would charge no sales tax for one day so you could buy school supplies. It was a great idea. And I got up in front of them and I said, why don't you do it all year long? <laughs> you know, if it's a good idea for one day, why isn't it a good idea for the whole year? You know, instead of one day of no sales tax, why don't you chop a whole penny off permanently? I'll take it, you know, especially since we've got a 10% sales tax in Montgomery right now, you know. But uh, they don't like that. They, you know, they, it's easier to say one day sales tax free. You know, it's symbolism, Okay. That's exactly what you're seeing with this budget shortfall thing. Budget shortfall, it's a symbol. It's something that most people can get behind. They don't bother looking deep to see the claws of the beast. You know, all they see is the pretty facade that's painted over them. Okay. So. Yes, sir. Pet peeve of mine. Sorry. I bring it up. <laughs> I thought for sure sometime, somewhere you segued into, segued into it, but when Bob Riley's big war cry was to get rid of earmarks. 
another way to engage in fiscal illusion and all that sort of gamesmanship. Looking at those numbers, it screams at me the pressure for them to want to get rid of earmarking. I mean, how soon do you think they'll actually get it wet? It's going to depend on the legislature. And the legislature has not been kind to the concept. You know. Uh, but then again, the legislature isn't kind to lots of concepts. And that's partly our fault, but not even mostly. Matt Murphy was on the radio. He's a talk show host in Birmingham. He's on the radio. And he was telling everybody that it's our fault what the legislators do because you know, we're the ones who elect them. But if you look at them, and if you go out to the Politics Alabama uh, website, you can see a chart. Half of the state house sitting legis- or representatives today didn't have an opponent in the last general election. Half. Okay. What choice do we have? I mean, how can we change that half of the legislature? We don't have a choice, and they don't care what we say because we're not going to get a chance to vote for them anyway. You know? And as long as we have that kind of situation, the legislators are never going to care what we think because the ones that don't have an opponent this last time think, you know, hey, it'll happen again. And the ones that had an opponent this time say, maybe I won't have one next time, and it'll be my turn at the gravy train. You know, we got people out there who've had six terms with no opponent. Alvin Holmes had five terms with no opponent. That's the only name I remember. There's a good number of names on the list. But you know, that, that's the kind of thing. As long as that kind of situation continues, you know, there's underlying problems of everything. So you can always point to one more thing. Yes, sir. What's happening in Arizona? Nothing has been submitted to the legislature so far this session, so far this session, to change the Constitution. Um, I think, my opinion, I have nothing to back this up, my opinion is they're not going to try this year because it's been beaten so badly the past few times they've tried it. But I think within the next two or three election cycles you'll see it pushed back up and you'll see the, you know, excuse me, the constitutional convention idea come about, which is probably the worst idea I can possibly think of. The same people who we complain about how bad a job they do in the legislature would have some control over completely rewriting it in their own image. Are you kidding? No, thank you. Well, last time it was brought up, you were one of the folks, and certainly I was as well, getting on the Rockwell show about the soldiers that just shouted down so bad, he said he lost his Well, there are actually a few amendments that have been introduced to the uh, legislature this session that do exactly that. This provision has been superseded. It's no longer valid. Repeal it. That's perfect. You know, that's the kind of thing you need. The only type of a uh, constitutional rewrite I would support would be one that only compiled all of the amendments into a single document. Just, you know, removed them by applying them into the document itself. That'd be the only constitutional rewrite I would support. Yes. Sir. It's specifically prohibited in the oh, state. Yeah. yeah. No. no the, the argument there is if you have a none of the above situation, then you don't have a legislature, legislator sitting in the seat. And the people of his district are not represented. The, the, of course, they're missing the point that the people of, the, of his district chose not to be represented. But, you know. I suppose it could happen if nobody ran. Yeah, what do they do if nobody runs? Uh, well, if nobody runs, they'll do essentially like Dick Brubaker did at the last minute. He'll file his papers and he'll get in. Uh, Dick Brubaker, by the way, is one of, in my opinion, one of the better legislators. I, I like what he does. He does a lot of good work. Okay, but 
He came in at the last minute without an opponent. He never faced an opponent in the general election, and he never faced an opponent in the primary. Nobody has ever voted with a choice for Dick Brubaker. And that's bad. You know, He's a good legislator. I think he is. I honestly do right now. But how he got in was bad. He needs an opponent. Everybody needs an opponent. At least one opponent. Two, three, four. They're talking about crowded ballots. Hey, that's fine. I don't, when I go out to eat dinner, I don't choose between McDonald's and Burger King. I got hundreds of restaurants to choose from. And that's why I can always pick the one that best suits my needs today. Because I've got a lot of choices. We don't need two choices. We don't need one choice. We need ten choices. There are a few bills that have been introduced to reduce the ballot access requirements. The, app, the most interesting did not, believe it or not, did not come from a third party. Okay, and its proposal is to take the the state judgeships, make them nonpartisan. There is no signature requirement for this, only a filing fee, two percent of the salary. That's great. Nonpartisan. I don't care whether Democrats or Republicans look at their case histories. That's how you judge a judge. What decisions have they made, right? No, no, no signatures. You don't need people to say yes. I want you to be a judge. They do that at the ballot box anyway. You just pay that little filing fee, and you're on the ballot. Now, I'd love to see that. I'd love to see that for the governor, and all the other statewide, you know, statewide races, and the legislature. Let's get the parties out of the legislature. That's great. And that's probably the most interesting bill. And because it's the most interesting and promising bill I've seen. It ain't going nowhere. <laughs> My opinion. I could be wrong, but I don't think it's 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 gonna it's gonna get passed. Speaking of opinion, you know, a lot of times their budget projections, of course, are wrong. Yes. Uh, they don't necessarily pan out. Sometimes they over project, overspend, and then they have to come in with an unexpected proration. A lot of times they under project, and they end up with that. And they spend it. And well, yeah, they spend it. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. They'll always find a way to, uh, to burn every last dollar by the end of the, uh, by the, end of the fiscal year. Well, the budget has at its bottom. Yes, yes. We, they dipped into it last time to pay off uh, some of the, the, the budget. And we, that's one of the arguments is with that kind of an increase in funding, we should completely rejuvenate the rainy day fund. But, the, but Paul Hubbard is saying no, 7% teacher pay increase. And, you know, that's the kind of thing that's biting into us. But at the bottom of every budget, you've got a section of conditional appropriations, which is appropriations, money we can spend if we have it. Okay? Well, they don't have it. That's fine. But, hey, income is now going, you know, or the state revenue is increasing more than we thought it would. Guess what? These conditional appropriations kick in one by one. Boom, 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 boom. So... And th there's no way we actually come up in the year with w more money, you know, with a surplus than we, than we thought we would because those conditional appropriations will eat it all up as quick as they can. And we, ought, we actually saw it. There was um, some late uh, uh, disbursements of cash. When we, when we knew we were going to have a surplus, there were some late disbursements of cash these last couple of months, you know. So it's interesting. Well, when the state of Alabama, our economy is not the general economy. Is uh, sort of unbalanced or lopsided um, in the sense that things like forestry, agriculture, the mining, coal, oil, that sort of thing are fairly large compared to the overall economy. You can take government out of the picture, you take hospitals and things of that out of the picture, and you look at what Alabama does differently. Those are the primary sources of income. And you know, I would think, given the fact that oil and coal prices are so high, and the fact that uh, forest crop prices are so high, and uh, that uh, agricultural crops are, are pretty high, and you know, cotton is uh, at pretty good price, things of that nature, that if all of those things were true, that you would expect higher income, higher income taxes, higher sales tax revenue, um, then if you just do a straight line, which is what most of their projections are based on, yeah. a pencil and a ruler. And don't, don't, don't ever doubt it. The income projections, projections are also based on how much they want to spend. That gets in there. Yeah. I mean, because there's, there's real, I've seen the figures. I've seen figures from one agency and, and another agency talking about how much revenue we'd have, and there's like $200, $300 billion difference in between. 
or a million dollars different. So, you know, they're, it's not as scientific as you'd like, as we would like to believe. But, uh, well, they never project recessions. They always do. A little more, yeah. Spe- growth. Spending always goes up. Always goes up. Unless we have a proration situation. The, 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 the legislature, in my memory, has never budgeted less this year than they had last year. Never. Never. They may run into spending too much and have to cut back through proration, but I've never seen them actually budget less spent this year than they did last year. It doesn't happen because they always want to spend more. It's that increasing thing. Uh, I've got some figures from, uh, I don't know if you all ever read the Governing Magazine. They come out with a yearly source book. The last one was June of 2004, and based on that information, Alabama still had a negative economic momentum. It was small, I think four-tenths of one percent. But our economy was still trending downward, the negative economic momentum, not growing. Now, that's obviously changed a little bit with the sales tax and, you know, the revenue we're seeing. But Alabama has not responded like a lot of the other, the rest of the nation has. You know, our economy is not growing gangbusters. I, I, I want to see the new numbers they come out with in a couple of months to see what, to see how it's, we changed over the last year. Well, that's what I mean by but, Alabama's economy is out of sync with, with the rest of the American economy. Well, not the entire rest of the economy, but it's not a high-tech economy. It's a lot more manufacturing now than it used to be. Um, But its sources of income are different. And when you look at our tax, if you look at the tax revenue and our tax burden, it looks really low. We're always down in the low 40s. Uh, You know, the, the 47th lowest taxes in the nation. Okay. But when you look at it on a per capita basis as a percent of our personal income, we're about up in the you know 13 to 20 range because our income is a lot lower than most other states as an average. Okay, and so therefore the same amount of money taken out of ours is a bigger bite, percentage-wise. So we actually rank higher when you look at taxes as a percentage of our per, per capita personal income. We're way up there in the in the tax. And I've seen, like I said, over the time I've seen this range between 13 and 20. In the rankings, and it's ridiculous. It's like when you look at teachers' pay, for example. Teachers' pay, where we saw the report a week ago, it said what we were 47th, 46th in the nation, some really low, okay, lowest teachers' pay. They weren't taking into account any of the benefits that they get. You know, the vacation, the health care. You pay one dollar, you got health care. Good heavens, that's a wonderful benefit. I'd love it. You know, uh, but they weren't taking any of that into account. And somebody actually went to them and talked to them, spent some time, figured it out. And if you took that into account, we were up in the 20s. Yeah, the, the retirement, yeah. There's a bill in front of the legislature right now that will allow people who've had military service to buy in uh, a retirement time. If you've had four years of military service, you can you then pay the premiums that you would normally pay, a dollar a month, a dollar, <laughs> whatever. You know, pay your premiums that you normally pay, and you get credit for that as just as if you've been employed by the state. But you weren't employed by the state, so you shouldn't get retirement benefits for it. You know, this is just one more way to get additional expense uh, more benefits for the employees, more expense for the taxpayers. And it's one of the problems that we have because the legislators still do that kind of thing. Yes, sir? I know in California, during the late 90s or whatever, when their budgets were going up, their revenues were going up tremendously, so they didn't track what they at all. Uh, instead of saving some of that money, the uh, legislators obviously just went off and gave venues to. Uh, State bureaucrats and went on program, and now they're going to have to pay the price. Is this state done basically the same type of thing? Uh, during, or, I mean, they may not have experienced the uh, increase in revenue that California did, but I wonder if they did the typical of most uh, yes. states doing the same thing. Pretty much. And you saw the economic boom times, you know, uh, if you look at st- all, around, all around the nation, most states will increase their spending to match the revenue, and it's a recurring expenditure. Well, we all know this, okay? Economies don't go straight up. Or straight down forever. You cycle. Okay? You have good economic times and bad economic times. Good economic times, bad economic times. Well, the spending levels don't have anything to do with the economic times. You know, it's just when you get an increase in revenue, they increase the spending to match. And then when the revenue starts to drop, they start to panic. And the only way out of it is to raise taxes. So, yeah, that's exactly what happens. And it's not just Alabama, it's all over the nation. In the state government, uh, there's so many automatic. Increases in spending 
people get automatic raises, promotions, uh, health care costs go up, you know, by so much. And you know, just years of service, there's a whole series of things. The rental agreements that they agree to um, have automatic increases in it. And most of the office space that the state government rents, they actually rent it from the Alabama retirement system. So the retirement system builds these lavish offices that are ready to work there. Um, and the state pays you know, huge rent for the retirement. And, and, and you're exactly right. One of the big debates is how much of a raise to give teachers this year. The debate isn't should we give teachers a raise, it's how much. It's, it's how much because there's a state law that was passed a few years back that says if you get more than I think is a 3 or 4% increase in revenue to the education trust fund, you have to give teachers a pay raise. It's a mandatory pay raise. Well, look at that. We triggered it. They have to get a pay raise. Okay? So the question is how much? That's the only question we have. And you're right. That's a bad thing. Anytime you're forced into giving a pay raise simply because you got the money, you know. I was talking to a uh, city council in Wetumpka a few years back. They were considering dropping a sales, one penny on the sales tax. And I was up there saying, yes, it's a good idea. You should do that. And as I left, one of the county commissioners corralled me. He says, I want you to be more persuasive because we could use that, that one penny sales tax that we're going to raise as soon as they drop it. You know, city councilman over in Montgomery once told me, we can always use more money, and that's true. They can always spend more money. There is no limit to it. You could double the budget today, and they could spend it. Okay? Department of Corrections, if you gave them their double budget, they'd be hollering for more within two years. No, they're never satisfied. Colorado has a good system that they implemented a few years ago, and what they do is they take last year's budget, multiply it, times the increase in population. So if the population went up by 1%, they would multiply last year's budget by 101%. And then they adjust it for the cost of living so that in any one year, the budget can only go up by that, just by those two factors. So you get a definite amount for the penny increase. And if the revenues come in in excess of that, it has to be returned to the taxpayer. It doesn't go into the rainy day fund. I like that. Uh, or left over for you know some other project. <clears throat> it goes back to the taxpayer, and they have to start all over again the next year. So that the legislature, legislators, and bureaucrats want to spend more money, um, but they're focused more on you know what can we cut so that we can spend money on. It. Mm -hmm. Favorite projects, and of course, there's a lot of debate and uh, public pressure to get rid of this amendment to the Constitution and overspend those limits and things of that nature. But there's also, uh, you know, a lot of people think that the legislature uh, does a much better job of managing resources because they drop programs and drop resources, they sell off those people. In order to keep their pet projects going. So that they're more attentive to the general needs of the population, whatever you want to call it. And, and that's a good idea. When uh, uh, Riley was elected, I sent a, uh, uh, a series of uh, proposals and things he should think about when crafting his first budget. And one of them was that you had to have some way of examining programs, examining spending to see if it's accomplishing what you intended it to. And if it's not, cut it. Figure out another way to do it and do it that way instead. And of course, uh, I never heard back from him. He's not terribly interested in that kind of common sense. That's the kind of, of, of wisdom you get when you talk to a business owner. Okay, the business owner says, is it pay, is what we're doing here paying for itself? No, stop it. Well, he has insisted on this performance based budget. Which I haven't seen its effects yet. Well, unfortunately. It's I haven't seen its effects yet. <laughs> You know, here's your money, here's your duty, and did you accomplish your goal? But instead of saying, if you didn't, we're going to cut you. If you didn't, then you're going to get more money. More money. So, 
You didn't quite get the message. You didn't read all the way down to the bottom. Of the <laughs> well, government actually, that is a common problem, and that is that the government rewards failure. They always view it as we didn't do it with enough money. And so, therefore, increasing the funding for the next year will allow us to accomplish our goal. That is the way the government collective tends to think. And there's individuals who are different. Like I said, Dick Brubaker doesn't seem to think that way when I talk to him. But as a collective, that's the way they think. And so then when the schools are getting constant C's and D's on our, our performance and how they teach their students, well, let's just funnel more money into them. That's the solution. It doesn't help because the same people are involved in spending the money and they're running the same programs that gave us the poor student education in the first place. But it's more money, therefore it must be good. So, and that's, that's one of the problems is the legislators tend to focus on money, not on performance. They don't care about performance. You know, They just want to know, as long as they can hand money out, they've got power. They've got prestige. They can go on talk radio shows and TV shows, and they can be go to banquets and, and you know go to the GOP local convention, local uh, meeting and be welcomed with open arms. You know. Well, what happens to the legislators who don't do that? Who don't put bills out? Who don't bring money home? They get voted out the next election. So yes, sir. Well, I was just going to say there was something um, inherently wrong. On Yes. And that's why one of, one of the problems I have with um, uh, government competing in the private sector businesses, such as the ABC stores. Okay, You've got government with their ability to just take in whatever money from the taxpayers they want, and there's no restrictions they have, really, effectively. They can underprice anybody they want, fund it with taxpayer dollars, run anybody out of business they wanted to, if they chose to. Okay, That's the kind of power they have, running up against the privately owned package stores. I'd rather see privately owned package stores. It's not going to happen. Uh, Fulmer, Emery Fulmer, former mayor of Montgomery, is now head of the ABC board, and he made the right noises at the beginning. Yeah, we're going to see about privatization, he says. Then he went in and came out and said, we can't. And I said, well, why can't you? He said, because we have leases with the, biz with the buildings for like five or ten years down the road. Sell the leases to whoever buys the package store. No, no, we can't do that. Okay. Yeah, phase them out one by one. Yeah, but see, it doesn't happen that way. So it, the changes that we want to see are very hard to make simply because of the types of people that get up there. You know, I, I've had my disagreements and agreements with Mayor Falma, but I always gauged my opinion of him based on what he was doing. And it's lower now than it was before because of what he's not doing that he could do with the ABC board. Yes, sir. Are you saying that the, the ABC board is pricing below the cost? No, I said they, they, I said they could. If you want to look at it, though, um, there is, a, there is a, go to a package store, privately owned package store. Compare the, out, the price of the alcohol with what you'll find in an ABC store. It's higher. Why? Because there's one more link in the, in the supply chain. I mean, the, the, uh, uh, the store owner has to make his profit, too. Right now, when you pay $20 for a bottle of booze, 10 bucks of that is taxes. Half of it is taxes. I've seen the breakout. Well, the ABC board admits it. The, the package store has to buy from the ABC store to pass the retail price. Correct. You, that's, this is great. He's exactly right. Let's say you go to all the trouble and you start a winery. And you make your wine. And you've got all the licenses and you're fine. And you've got all the wine. You're ready to sell it. You can't sell it to somebody who walks in your door. You have to sell it to the state. The state can sell it back to you. You can sell it then to the to the customer. You can't sell your wine directly. You have to sell it to the state first. No, you, you, you can. There's two wineries, three wineries in Alabama. Yes. No. You can't make any alcohol for personal use unless you're licensed. Nothing. Federal law says you can make up to 200 gallons per year for personal consumption. That what well, one, 100 gallons per per adult with a two adult household. That's 200 gallons. I don't know about you. I can't drink 200 gallons worth of beer 
wine or anything in a year, not and still keep my job and stay out of AA. Uh, but that's what federal law allows you to do. State law says you can't make any kind of alcoholic beverage without the tax stamps. Why? Without the tax stamps. That's why. They want the tax money. They don't want you making your wine or your beer and drinking it instead of buying from the ABC. Because, again, everything goes through the ABC store. In addition to the taxes, they also get the markups they do when, you, when the alcohol is sold to the ABC board and then they sell it to the retailer. They, there's a markup automatically. So they get a lot of profit. You, you, you can get a criminal charge for possession of marijuana without the tax stamps. Anybody want to get bet that there's a cop down there waiting for the idiot? I want tax stamps for my marijuana. <laughs> the, the whole point is to give another charge you can pile on them with the thing there. Yeah, and to get the money. And here's the uh, here's another interesting bill that's before the legislator legislature. Ever, anybody ever heard of pseudoephedrine? It's a decongestant. Okay, it's in well maybe half the uh, cough you know cough medicines that you'll find on the market, open market. Okay. Pseudoephedrine is also a precursor drug for the making of methamphetamines. Don't nod so, so we, we, we might think you might know this for, you know. <laughs> um, so it's a precursor drug. So the new bill in front of the legislature says that any, any product, including cold medication, over-the-counter cold medication, that has pseudoephedrine above a certain concentration, you have to show a photo ID and sign a register in order to buy it. And you're limited to three packages at a time. I'm trying to stop the dreaded production of methamphetamines, but I gotta show a driver's ID, a driver's license now to buy my cold medication? Good gravy. I don't know. Dick, can you tell us? <laughs> I'm sorry, you just nodded so quickly when I said it before, I just couldn't resist. <laughs> I don't know how much it would take, but the, the point is, they're, you know, the, 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 they're moving over into a lot of things. They've got their one goal, that's the goal they're after, and to heck with everything else, you know. So what, you've got to show a driver's license and sign a form when you buy your cold meds. We have an important goal we're trying to reach, and you're just going to have to be inconvenienced. <laughs> it, 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 there's a lot of things you can learn by looking at what the legislator tries to do. Even if the, the ones that fail are more interesting than the ones that succeed sometimes. What are they trying to do? Not a, everybody knows what they did do, but what did they try to do? It's, it's fascinating sometimes. So we're, uh, we're out of time, but I want to thank you for a great presentation coming down from Montgomery. Thanks. And like you, <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.